my experience is that a lot of first year students get into this semester and they have what I think of as a rule of law attack. They come in with high ideals and abstract notions of justice and then they look at the way that a sausage is made. And that's always a bad idea. They get into these Supreme Court cases and they think, oh my goodness, it's nothing like what I imagined. And then we finish on Bush versus Gore, which is in some ways a really bad and dispiriting way to finish. And so they think, is there any point in this whole constitutionalism thing? And my answer is unambiguously yes. Constitutionalism on balance is a huge civilizational advance. And I'm going to tell you why. Now, that's not to say I'm going to defend the work of the court or I'm even going to criticize the work of the court. I'm going to talk about constitutionalism in general why it matters to the world, and why it should matter to you. Now, many Americans entertain a particular image of themselves. Many Americans like to think that we are all self-made men and women, that we strive, we compete, we rely only on our own individual efforts, and we should take credit for everything that we have done. A lot of Americans are really proud of that image. Some of you may have seen the Broadway musical Hello, Dolly. And in Hello, Dolly, Horace Vandergelder tells his head clerk, let me tell you something, son. I've worked hard, and I've become rich and friendless and mean. And in America, that's about as far as you can go. But I believe that this image is false. In this country, as in all countries. We rely on other people desperately, hopelessly, utterly, gloriously, and passionately. Other people give us meaning and identity. They create and ensoul us. And we must therefore hope that at least some of them love us. Loving and being loved are the most central human experiences. You are defined by the people whom you love and who love you. The most appropriate response to the human condition is not, in fact, pride in our individual achievements, but gratitude for the people who have been given to us. And if you have not given thanks for the people in your life yet today, you should do so. Now, the opposite of love is not hatred, it's fear. <laughs> the enemy of love is fear. And as much as we need each other, we also fear each other. But that's where constitutions, among other things, come in. People who live under constitutional governments fear less because they have less to fear. And as a result, they have a better chance to structure a life full of all the great gifts available to us. Constitutions help to make fully realized human lives possible. And there is nothing more significant than that. Now, some people, as we know, some justices on the Supreme Court want to go further. They want to claim that the Constitution actually has the power to abolish fear. It offers us perfect safety because it is a set of objective, never-changing rules. And if only we follow these time-tested rules, we will be safe from each other, and the country won't fall apart <coughs> in the way that other countries have. So for a moment, let's be realistic. Words on a page by themselves never saved anyone from anything. And we are not perfectly safe because of our Constitution. And there is no way to know what the future will hold. If Americans want to kill each other, we will, and the Constitution will not save us. So constitutions can't abolish fear, but they can help us to keep it within manageable bounds, and then everything else becomes possible. After people have been through civil war, as our framers had, fear is everywhere. There is so much fear out there in the world right now. 
It's an ocean that tends to swamp whatever flame of hope might light the landscape. And because these people have learned to distrust each other, they are reluctant to enter into any kind of compact with each other. They feel that they have to go on fighting because there is no alternative. But constitutions offer an alternative. And when people have bled out enough, they are sometimes ready to try anything. Now, constitutions are aspirational. They promise a better day. But they're also concrete, and that's part of their glory. They're very hard-headed. They're not naive or fuzzy. They specify a particular form of government. And so when you commit to a constitution, the commitment is not blind. You know what you're buying, and you think it's a good deal. And that's why you commit. The best constitutions allow everyone to think that they have gotten a good deal. And so when you enter a constitution with people who were recently your enemies, you don't have to trust to their goodwill. They have reason to protect the new structure of government, just like you, because it offers a better future for them, if it's well designed. I am continually amazed that people have the courage to see this prospect when the blood is still wet on the ground. But sometimes they do. And our framers did, and that's their greatness. John Short wrote, the only question that matters in combat is what you do once the pain starts. And that's true not just about combat, but really about all of human life. What are you going to do once the pain starts? So constitutions help manage fear because they offer hard-headed, practical alternatives to conflict. And once they are up and running, they can help in another way. They can become almost self-perpetuating. If people's lives become better at, after the adoption of a constitution, they will become committed to it. They'll come to feel that it allowed them to come out of darkness into light. And as they come to realize that the Constitution gives them tools to build a better future, they will become fond of it, they will become grateful to it, and they will become grateful to those who put it in place. In Burma, I am constantly saying, at this moment, we are making decisions. And future generations will bless our name or curse us because of what we did today. And that's why constitutions matter. Now, eventually, citizens will sometimes form a part of their identities around the Constitution. To know who I am as an American, you must know something about the US Constitution, because it made the world that made me. It gives us all a self-image to which we try to live up. It demands better of us, because we deserve to have better demanded of us. Now, we see that the people ratified the Constitution in 1787, but actually at that point it was completely unclear whether Americans would stick with that document. The Constitution survived because in all the years that followed, the people took it into their hearts. And that was the real ratification of the Constitution. And we still do that every day. And sometimes, when a constitution works really well, the citizens become grateful not only to it, but to each other. They come to understand that they depend on fellow citizens. And they understand that together, they make constitutionalism possible. And so they feel that they have obligations together. And we might call this civic love. It's not the kind of love that you feel for your most intimate companions, but it is a kind of affection to all those other people, most of them strangers, who together created a country that made your life possible. 
we are wonderfully diverse and we are all individuals, <coughs> but we are also a people. Not the kind that shares a common religion or race or ethnicity or even language, but the kind that was brought into existence by a foundational law and that anticipates a future structured by that law. And that is the Constitution, and nothing matters more. Now, as you may have noticed, a lot of constitutional law is about the significance of the passage of time. It's about tradition, and it's also about change. It's about a living tradition, to use a particular phrase. We deeply need our constitutional past. To function, countries need broadly shared beliefs about the nature of political authority so that we can peacefully resolve our differences. The past is critical. Now, those understandings inevitably come from the past, and so that's where con law always starts. The tradition frames us. It's a charter for an evolving <coughs> cultural enterprise. But countries that look only to their past, only to their past, lose their hope, their belief that something better is possible. And so we also need the future. Now, I've now spent a lot of time in other countries. And I have found so much out there to love that I am sometimes reluctant to come home. But when I do come home, to my own country, to my own people, and I arrive in an American airport, I am always struck by how loudly Americans talk. <laughs> really too loudly. But these voices, they're so loud because they're so full of confidence. They're so full of hope. They're laying hands on their future. And what a glorious thing this is. So many Americans retain the belief that even though poverty and racism and sexism <coughs> and general corruption may always have been a part of life, it need not always be so. Nowhere is it written that we must live lives cramped and full of fear, startling at sounds in the night. Humans make their world and they can remake it if they choose to do so. And Americans believe the choice is up to us. Simone Veil wrote, quote, at the bottom of every human being, from the earliest infancy until the tomb, there is something that goes on indomitably expecting in the teeth of all experience of crimes committed, suffered, and witnessed that good and not evil will be done to him. It is this above all that is sacred in every human being. Perfectly ordinary people sometimes have this moral glamour about them. They are heroes because they get up every day and they insist on expecting better. And this is the America that I love best. This vision of ourselves as a people bound together by our past but striving to do better, cheerfully taking up the endless, exhausting, often discouraging work of making a better Many people in foreign lands think that modern Americans are bloated, domineering imperialists. And let us face facts, there is some truth in that view. But there is also another America, a constitutionalist America. It is relentlessly self-critical and idealistic, never complacent, never smug. After the massacre in Tiananmen Square, reporters sought out one of the protesters, a young Chinese woman with native <coughs> English, and they asked her why she risked her life in this way. And until the day I die, I will never forget her answer. Here's what she said. 
Abraham Lincoln said that government of the people, by the people, and for the people must not perish from the earth. This I believe. And this I believe too. And at the heart of this American self-conception is the rule of law. The resolution that when we act together, we will seek something that we brazenly call the common good. And we will not seek to hurt one another. Indeed, part of what it means to be constituted as a people is that we will cherish each other. Because we had, could have no existence as Americans without other Americans. Without civic love of this sort, constitutionalism is impossible. We are resolved, above all, that we will not use the law merely to hurt each other, to gain advantage, or to symbolically assert the superiority of some over others. Now, it's a terrible cliche to quote Lincoln. But without Lincoln, what would America be? He is completely indispensable. So let me borrow his words and recall that these words were spoken in the midst of a great civil war in which Americans actively sought to kill one another. And he said, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work that we are in to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Now that's constitutionalist talk. If you haven't discovered it yet, let me offer you a home truth. There are only two types of people in the world. There are those who have been broken, and there are those who will be broken. And if you haven't been broken it yet, it may be that you're living your life too timidly, because it's our fate to be broken and to get back up. And when your time comes to be broken, you're going to need some people who love you for the goodness that is in you, and not by your conquests in this competitive race of life, because sooner or later, we all get broken. Maybe your parents were alcoholics. Maybe they abandoned you. Maybe your father was angry all the time. Maybe he hit you. Maybe you grew up in a house without a single book, and you felt like a phony in the educational system. Maybe you made some really dumb mistakes early on, and you're worried that you'll be paying for them for your whole life. It is inherent in human life to be hurt. We are all hurt. And we don't need to use the legal system to hurt one another more. Let me go back to Lincoln's words again. I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched, as surely they would be by the better angels of our nature. Now that's constitutionalist talk. This honoring of the rule of law is endless and grueling work, but it is the best work that we can do together. Collectively, we are a part of this great work, and collectively, we bring into existence this cultural enterprise called the United States of America. And that construct has at times claimed that at its root, lies this absurd political fantasy that governments can exist to act for the good of their people 
not as a way for one group of citizens to hurt another. In 200 years, historians may look back and find some truth in that fantasy, or they may not. Americans believe that the choice is up to us. To borrow words from that great American Billy Joel, someday we'll all be gone, but lullabies go on and on. They never die. That's how you and I will be. And the Constitution is a national lullaby that we sing nightly to each other. Yeah. Even though the justices claim that the Constitution belongs to them and only to them, we know that it is not so. The Constitution must belong to all of us because it calls us into being as a people. And in turn, only the citizenry can make it a lived reality. The Supreme Court regards the Constitution as a source of specific doctrinal rules, enforceable in court, the rules that we have been studying this semester and that you're now going to study even more aggressively. It is that, but it's not only that. It's also the foundation of our public culture, our public identity, and our public meaning. And if we leave the Constitution to the court, it will have only the meaning that the court gives it. So if you have been unhappy with the court this <coughs> semester, once you get tired of blaming them, you might ask yourself, have I been asking them to carry a burden that they could not possibly carry alone? Have I expected them to secure our salvation when only the American people as a whole can do that? So the court can't be the exclusive guardian of the Constitution, but I want to also offer the observation that it probably does have a special role. And it would have this role even in a better world for two reasons. First, Americans tend to believe that democracy is the best political system on earth. It is the root of our Constitution. But democratically elected leaders also have certain characteristic pathologies. They pass the buck, as in New York against the United States. They create outcasts, as they do under the Equal Protection Clause. They fail to find common frames of reference, as in the abortion debate. They pertinaciously refuse to change the electoral system that put them in office, even if it is unfair, and so forth. Now, precisely because these are democratic pathologies, the democratic system has difficulty correcting them. So maybe we need an unelected outsider like the Supreme Court to correct them, precisely because the court is itself undemocratic. And second, the court might have a special role because it has a unique job. Congress should care about the Constitution, but it should also heed the popular will. It's got to balance those. The president should care about the Constitution, but he should also prosecute the national interest. He's got to balance those. We gave the court one power and one power alone to speak truth <coughs> to power. That's its job. And if you have been frustrated with the court this semester, remember that you are unable to be frustrated only because the court's actual performance contrasts with an ideal that you have in your mind of what the court should be doing. And you are unable to have that ideal only because we assigned the court this job. And so regardless of its day-to-day -day performance, its existence as part of our legal fundament all by itself insists that we are a people brought into life by the breath of war. People love to say, that we can never do better as an excuse for not doing better. People love to say that the world cannot be changed as an excuse for not changing the world. But in the ideal, though not in the messy reality, the Constitution and the Supreme Court exist to remind us 
that a country can be founded on the idea that we can and will always do better. That the heart of America is not complacency, but hope, progress, and love. <coughs> and just as the court is central to that project, so are lawyers. So are you, as lawyers. Now listen to me. You have chosen your profession wisely. There will always be lawyers who are only interested in robbing their clients and abusing the system. And there will always be non-lawyers who think that all lawyers are like that. They always have been, and they always will be. And maybe you know some people who think that way. In fact, maybe some of them are in your family, and they're ashamed of you. But it's not true. The greatest lawyers have always been those who found meaning in a life lived richly in the law by caring for their clients and for the law itself. What makes lawyering different from other lucrative professions is that we are responsible, we are responsible for the system through which Americans try to articulate their deepest fears and highest ideals. Now you can rob your clients, you can abuse the system if you want to, or you can care for the law. And Americans believe that the choice is yours to make. In the wonderful play, A Man for All Seasons, Thomas More's son-in-law tells him that he would cut down every law in England if it were necessary to kill the devil. And More responds, oh, and when the last law was down, and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide the laws all being flat? This country is planted thick with laws. Man's laws, not God's, from coast to coast. And if you cut them down, and, if you're, and you're just the man to do it, do you really think you could stand up right in the winds that would blow then? Yes, I would give the devil the benefit of law for my own safety's sake. Lawyers keep the laws from being laid flat. And so we keep the winds from coming, and people are able to stand upright because of us. You have chosen your profession wisely. So let me close with two images. Here is the first. Oliver Wendell Holmes and Learned Hand were close friends. And Oliver Wendell Holmes was promoted to the Supreme Court, and Learned Hand never was. And some people thought that was a mistake, because in our language, Oliver Wendell Holmes was a pure positivist. So maybe he should not have been the one to go to the Supreme Court. But one day, they were turning from lunch, um, and they come to the steps of the Supreme Court building, and Holmes goes up, and Hand stays at the bottom, because Hand is not on the Supreme Court, but Holmes is. And when Holmes gets halfway up, Hand cries out to him, do justice, Holmes. And his memoirs, he can't remember why he said it, but it seemed overwhelmingly important at the time. And Holmes turned round on him and with Brahmin mustachios quivering said, I don't do justice. I only apply the law. So in fact, maybe the wrong man was promoted to the Supreme Court. Now that's the first image. Here's the second. And it's a lullaby of sorts, as the sun goes down on our day together. It was written about humankind in general, but I think it's especially relevant to lawyers. And so it's especially relevant for you, and about you, as you become lawyers. As you take up the central task of our profession, the hard and grueling work of honoring the rule of law. 
to which you will be committed for the rest of your lives. Poor soul, here for so little, cast among so many hardships, filled with so many desires, so incommensurate and so inconsistent, savagely surrounded, savagely descended, irremediably condemned to prey upon his fellow lives. Who would have blamed him had he been at peace with his destiny and a being merely barbarous? And we look and behold him instead filled with imperfect virtues, infinitely childish, often admirably valiant, often touchingly kind, <coughs> sitting down amidst his momentary life to debate of right and wrong and the attributes of the deity, rising up to do battle for an idea. To touch the heart of his mystery, we find in him one thought, <coughs> strange to the point of lunacy, the thought of duty, of something owing to himself, to his neighbor, to his God. An ideal of decency to which he would rise if it were possible. A limit of shame below which, if it be possible, he will not stoop. Of all Earth's mediums, here at least is the strangest and most consoling, that this ennobled lemur, this mind-crowned bubble of the dust, this inheritor of a few years and sorrow, should yet deny himself his rare delights and add to his frequent pains and live for an ideal. I wish you all lives lived richly in the world. So.